My name's Holiday. Um, I'm founder of I Am Terrain, which is a record label and crew. Um, the name I Am Terrain is basically comes from old Buddhist text, which means I Am means before our eyes. And Terrain is because we play a lot of more outdoor events, um, kind of all over the States, a couple international gigs, but it's more like as a collective, we all kind of really enjoy nature. We love nature. As we camp, we share music, we mix, we record mixes out in nature. Um, whether it's a foggy landscape, morning sunrises, things like that. So we have a, a very natural point of reference for how we collect music, um, how we relate to music. And that's the real special word is you could be a DJ. We can, and that's great because you learn your chops, you learn techniques. But to be a collector, you just you you zone into certain textures. There's, you zone into certain eras of music, and um, I always found that really really special because then you're seeing things beyond uh, things like a like a, like a fad. It's it's not a, a and as the as much as that we're excited to kind of chime into is a deeper meaning to it because when we're with ourselves, we listen to these pieces of music. We appreciate the artists the remixers, the label even, that are involved with all that. So as a collector, it kind of encourages you to say, hey, what if I had all these sharp or major tracks, and what if I gave them another life? What if I took them and I tuned them a certain way? What if I took that four-minute track and turned it into an eight-minute track? It gives you more, more kind of train tracks to kind of mix in. And you'll still have those original pieces of music, but Ableton allows you to kind of take the track and be malleable with it. You can play with it. And as much as you can definitely do so, and, and a lot of that spirit kind of carries over from the vinyl, CDJs, kind of getting your hands on the tracks and feeling them. Um, what's really special with Ableton is you can actually say, I always kind of gravitate to this track, even though it's written at 127 or 130, I always find myself pitching down on decks, it will, it will tune the key down, but that's okay, I kind of like that, you know, it's, it's different. So Ableton allows you to have the original version of it, you can record it, you can examine it, you can really see the waves forms, like, is this like a six minute track, is it an eight minute track, does it start with a really soft, sparse kind of build up or do you want to just hit right on a hammer right when you send it out you can do all that and you could actually like <laughs> i don't really buy music very often but when i do i process it through ableton and i start archiving it so when i go into my hard drive i can pull up tracks either by key but mainly i kind of really really enjoy more resorting to playlists um through certain eras and like, I'll actually label certain mo like events that are coming up, or I have a personal series of mine that is just kind of like, a, you're, if you're authoring of stories of books, which are now playlists, I call my series Continents. So just places in the world, I feel like if I was in Fiji, I would play this. If I was in Honolulu, I would play this at sunset. Um, if I was in the Scottish Highlands, I would play this, you know, like, and it's definitive. It's like it's clear as day. It's not like, oh, I would try this. I'm going to kind of just wing it. I, I don't really wing things very often. Um, that's just because I've committed so much to the collecting part of it because we're fans of that. So I'm going to show you a little bit of what I mean when I say able to really kind of unlock certain things or allow you to really deeply analyze pieces of music. So I'm going to go over here. So as we see, here, we have a piece of music that is actually in A minor, right? And the reason why I actually put G sharp is because I actually have a collection that is filled with sharps. So a lot of like tribal music isn't sharp. So if you can follow me here, I have this really, I'm, like, I'm kind of a geek about all this stuff. Um, I actually have this app, piano app. So back in the day in the late 90s when I used to DJ, I used to walk around a guitar tuner and be like, oh, that's F sharp. Oh, that's, that's why I like it. That's interesting. You know, and I would identify keys because certain pieces of music, they're beautiful pieces of music, but 
the keys is it's kind of like that bell tone that rings in your head and you're just like, oh, yes, that's sharp, whatever. And on this piano, for example, um, if let's say let's say the root note, you have a you have, you have a maybe two or three tracks in A, right? So, right, you can go to like a D or an F. So imagine if you had three tracks in A, and then you take another group of tracks in D, and you took that step forward. That's called an energy mix. Is where you're actually using keys to take you to another level and taking the audience on this escalator. So if you broke this entire two hour set to three keys and you attacked it like that, that is what a really great mix of CDs I really love. It's called Global, Global Underground. And if you really pay attention to how they structured it, they structured it by keys. Every momentum was, was based upon the key structure itself. And you let the music do its thing. So by ironing out the exact keys you want to attempt, you're left with just your thoughts, well execution, good handwork. Whether you use fader mixing or you do a 30% rise and you do a snap on the cross fader, you can do so without saying, oh, I don't know. There's that feeling's out. There's no, it's like, no, this is happening. Like this is, this is, this is the way it is, you know? And you feel good about that move. Um, you also, when you, when you know keys, you can actually take almost, take a sidestep into sharp. So you can go from A, for example, and go into a C sharp if you want to. C sharp into F sharp, you can continue the momentum. So let's say a DJ before is playing and you're like, oh wait, that doesn't sound like, I thought it was F, but it's like off. Then you're like, oh wait, that's sharp then you address it as such. And you're not walking into like a burning house, for example. You're just like, no way, I can, I can do something about this, right? Like I could logically mix into this, knowing that at least the key tones I've selected are either you're meeting someone at a certain key or you're answering someone at a certain key. It's about momentum. And the audience doesn't sound like, we've all heard certain mixes where it's like off, right? It's like, wait, that's well mixed, but it just doesn't work, you know? That, that's a, a tone, right? So as an as a anxious youth, I learned that the hard way <laughs> many times in a dark warehouse. And I'm just like, oh, wait, I need to recollect my thoughts and learn from this, you know? So that's what I'm going to try to do for you guys today. So <laughs> All right, so back into this. We're going to examine a piece of music, which we're going to go back to that A minor. And I'm going to show you guys how I use Ableton not necessarily for everything I do, but as a tool of reference, right? So when I'm, I'm looking at here, this is about 201 bars. So 201 bars, that's right around, I'd say seven and a half minutes right there, right? So what we're gonna do is in Ableton, it allows you to do a lot of things. You can take symphonic music, and you can like re-granularize it, you can texturize it, you can iron it out. Um, this is what I would do with this track first, is I know that the 33, this spot right here, that's a great place. So when, it, when you see this 33, that's, that means you have 32 bars. So technically, if you actually mix, sent that track in, you knew right when the next, on, you're on beat, right when the main drums come in, it's spot on. 32 is like, 33 bars is like my, my favorite place to be. Um, so I'm gonna give you an example. Yeah. And this is a spectrum analyzer. So it lets me know that it's roughly right around A minor, which is true. You get to see the behavior, you get to see how a track was made. You get to see how it's EQ. If you look at a track from the late 90s to 2010, they're EQ differently. But with the craft of DJing, you're able to pick it up because one of the first things you do in the decks, right, is when you queue up the track, you're trying to set the trim. You're not, you're trying to get your levels, you're trying to get the board correct. You're not, you know, you want to make sure your crossfader is where it wants to be. 
And, by, and once you do that, then you cue up the shrimp and get the levels right. This is before you even worry about beat mixing. You're, you're trying to bring balance to the equation. You're not trying to come here, throw a track in and just like, wow, blast it out or send the mix in, it's too quiet. So when the main drums came in, that's, you see this graph. So it's interesting because this is where something visual is really, really good to know because we feel it, right? <clears throat> So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna set, I'm gonna zoom in. I know that this is pretty, this, this track kind of starts right with the beat, which is nice. So it kind of, it, it will guess that this is the first beat, which is true. Then I'm gonna go to kind of somewhere over here in the middle. I'm gonna make sure that's lined up. And it's actually lined up pretty good, but it can use a little bit of work. So in Ableton, you can adjust it with these things called markers. So I can set that marker there, or I can drag it here and I could bring that baby right in there now it's like right on it right so right when I go from the very beginning to this point I know that it's tight like it's on beat like I'm not worried about it drifting off and I'm doing so, doing that I'm gonna go to the end I usually work three warp markers which are kind of adjustment knobs right it's how you iron out a track so there is a way where I did also in, with vinyl where I would sample that into Ableton and take tracks that you cannot purchase. There's a lot of magic gems out there you cannot buy online. They're only limited to press. You can, you can bring that into Ableton and you can iron it out. Here's your question. Yeah. Um, is it abnormal for a track not to be perfect at 33 or whatever? Like why did you have to make an adjustment? So, so this track happens to hit right on a 33rd, the main drums. Yeah. So the one right next to it, which I'm going to show next, is a track that does not do that. Because the main drums, if I look at it, where do you guys, where do you guys think the main drums are? Just looking at that. Good question. You put a track, you put a track on, it has this like very sparse, weird way of working its way in. And then you realize this has been a few minutes of this, which is really awesome. Great way to start a mix, like a very dedicated mix. But anyways, what do you guys think is where the main drums are? Left and five. Six, right, right, right here? Yeah, that one right there. That's good. That, it, there, there is a time signature here, which we can use that. Um, close, very close. How about you guys? Anyone want to guess? 57? 57 is a good, good guess. Right around here, right? Right there? Oh, back more? Okay, yeah, pretty good guess. So looking at the structure of it, if I, if I was going to just do a straight radar analysis of this, the actual main beat, if you use the rest of this as a reference, is right here. So imagine this actual main part, because now you have this much gap, which is roughly two, three minutes of just sparseness. So if you were playing an 11 o'clock, like 11 p.m. slot, and you stepped into this and you sent this in, you knew you had a lot of road work to cover, or you had to set it in way early, right? So in Ableton, you can retain this and say, I can use this for a special mix where it comes in. I can actually hook up my mixer to a guitar pedal and give it some echo and just play around, just mangle, just have fun with the track. And then it comes into the actual beat right here, right after 113 bars. It, it's just interesting because it's just about what you feel, what you want to, what you want to commit this track to. Do you want it to make to use it like as a second or third track or fourth track in your mix? Then you would adjust it as such, which where you would, I'll go into that more, is where you actually would take this and set this as the first beat, and I would create breadcrumb trails of that beat, thirty-two bars of that, different versions of that. So by the time it hits a thirty-third bar, kind of like uh, what we saw earlier. So right where it's like right here, I can get some of that, get some of this, but right where that hits, it's gonna be on 33rd. That's just, I know that if I, if I mix that in, it would be two, three minutes, two, a few minutes of just layering. I could let that breathe. I could bleed that track in. And right when the beat hits, I knew exactly when it hit where I wanted to hit. So we'll go back to the first version here and I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that. And a little bit more about what Ableton can do. So we've set the first, first beat marker here. We've kind of adjusted the middle to kind of say, hey, that is it. 
I still have to catch the tail end of it here. So you kind of go towards the end. So when you set that marker, did that change the BPM? Nope. Nope. So the, what the marker does is that it, it irons out the track so it's in line with the BPM. It's on the clip, basically. You're setting it so it's on metronome, it's there. It's not like very late attack. It's not too early. It's like on beat. Okay, so is that like moving the entire beat It is. Yeah. It is without, without mangling because you can only do so much of it before it starts like distorting. Are you, are you saying that the song was originally produced not on the clip? Nope, nope. Um, it's just you're, you're, you're letting, you're adjusting it as such so that Ableton can just, with a human in, like, input, say this is actually where it is. So it allows you to do that. So I can take like Beethoven and put able, you know, Beethoven, if it happens to be at 117 Be Beethoven, I could set that, right? So what, that, what, what does that mean? What that means is that once you actually iron out a track so it has some rhythm in it, you can actually take that, and let's say you have three decks, on your third deck, you can send that in with an overlying conga line, or whatever, and you knew that that was tight. And you could just really flirt with that idea and just be weird, have some fun, right? But no, you can actually let that sit in there with good EQing and, and let those kind of play with each other, right? So now, Going back to this, this was an A, right? So I can also detune it, which is. I could do tune it more. So just by hearing that, I've taken the original piece. I can, I can print that in A. I can print that in G sharp. I can print that in A sharp. So I've taken one track and I print two different sharp versions of it. I can even jump, I could, I could turn this track to a, a, a C if I wanted to. And it, it, would be, it would be spot on. The point is, going back to the point like where if you love a piece of music so much, you would give it three or four different key versions of it without guessing, oh, is this track worthy to fit in this mix? It's like, no, it will, because I noticed I have different versions of it. Yes. Wasn't that uh, what you were saying was kind of one of your tricks? Uh, YouTube was going to take down the track if it did that. Yes. So there is a way. I don't encourage it very often. <laughs> I say go buy it, support the artist. But sometimes record labels go under. Sometimes artists, they throw in a towel or they move on to other things. They become bigger performing acts, right? There's a way you can actually go to YouTube, take that, and actually convert it to a wave file, which is, or you play the YouTube and you put it into your mixer and you, you record it into Ableton. Everything in Ableton is default recorded as wave, a wave file, a wave file, which is CD quality. Yes. So you're talking about um, matching keys, because this is, what you said, it's in A, because it's not right. like all the things just in right. A, is it A, it's major, right? Is it minor? Minor, minor. Okay, so major and minor are very close, but the root note is A. Yes, yes. That's that's the strategy. And that's what working in this style of mixing, which is called energy mixing, you're taking a few tracks, let's say, with your example, with the A, you can take a sidestep. If you want to go into sharp, you can go into C sharp, or you can just go A to D, right? So if you just, I don't know what, three tracks, 15 minutes, so you did 15 minutes of something, and you did another 15 minutes of something, there, you, I know it's such a long window, a DJ set, right? An hour or two hours, but you're taking, you're taking an audience on a literally journey on, a, on your belief on a scale that you felt. It wasn't so much as based on, the, oh, I got this hook. You got to check this out. Well, how long is that hook going to last? How far is that going to get you? Right? My intention is not to throw a hook at you. My intention is to show you how this group, this cluster of tracks are just so fortified and they just, they roll together. Like they just, they roll deep together. That's, that's the idea. So 
And, and I love DJing because it allows you to kind of just learn certain things and techniques and have fun with it. That's, that's the point. You're having fun with it. Um, I just, I gravitate towards tone and key. So when I can send out three, four tracks in a certain key and then throw another one on top of it that takes it to another level, it, it really, it really, you get good feedback. <laughs> I encourage that. Try that out. So this one here, that, that's an example of how you can actually rekey a track. So all I, all I do is this point, we don't have to wait the eight minutes to record it, but I would hit record and when you hit tab, it goes to your traditional arrangement view, which is kind of like logic. Um, it was a timeline view like that. So it would just print out the track and I'll give you an example. So there it is getting, getting printed into a finalization mode. So from there, from there you can do a lot of things. You'll start realizing you can actually just, if, if you need to EQ something in, in Ableton, you can do, uh, has a really, really good tool here where you can actually start throwing EQ8, right? And you can start boosting things. If, if the track's too dim or too dull, you can spice it up a little bit. It's the heart of a mixer. It's the heart of a mixer, except you can get really surgical. Right now it's only showing four bands, but you can open up all eight bands the traditional mixer has three bands, unless it's your, in Allen Heath, which you have four bands, which is technically, it's basically the third and fourth band is basically your low end, except the third band is a mid bass. You can actually bring in like the top kick of a drum, the tap, and then the bottom is like a sub. That's the, that's the only real difference, and it's obviously a pure analog signal um, between digital and analog. Um, so with Ableton, you can do that. So you can also change the timing of everything too. So not only can you change the key, so I could change the key. So you can rekey, you can re-BPM it, and if you realize you wanted to add your own drums to it, you can. But I'll leave that to another session because I've got actually a library of tracks where I actually have like congas and bongos. I like to add in as accent pieces that I'll embed them into the track. I'll EQ them out, kind of like making a sandwich is what EQing is. You don't want just like four layers of cheese. Well, I mean, obviously that's spray too, but <laughs> but. You know, you want to have a balance, which otherwise your mom's gonna yell at you, right? So you're gonna be like, oh, you, you, you want to balance it all out. So Ableton allows you to do that. Does anyone have any questions so far? Good. Okay, we're gonna examine this other piece of music, which is the more sparse one, and let's give it a good hearing. So this is again, it's an A. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. It, by default, you'll import anything into here, but the ultimate part where you export the actual so you edits you made, you want to start yeah. off good, yeah. Because you can, like, you'll start noticing if I take vinyl tracks sometimes, they're like this. What does that mean? It means that track was printed kind of quiet. It was printed in an era where it was a lot of tape, right? So tape is warm, but it's not loud. It's not loud. Which a lot of times if I took a piece of music and I, if I did not pre-EQ it before I record it into Ableton, it would come off just like that. So, um, and then from there you can adjust the gain. You can start trimming everything that you have. So, so you could just be on the fly and just throw tracks in, but why not take advantage of all the tech that you have at your hands here? You can actually get really surgical and iron out all these pieces of music. Um, so. This is an example, another one here. Yeah. 
So that's a lot of building. So if you threw a track in like that, it would work. It could work. It could work. So that's the first, you hear the first percussion coming in there. So I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. Right. Now, interesting stuff. So I'm gonna kind of go right over here to where I think the main part is. So that crash is a signature of when the track actually starts. Um, it's open-ended, you can play with it, you can create more of a suspense as you go into it. So let's just kind of just be simple and work with this very first peak right here. You see it? You guys see that? So I'm gonna kind of go right in here. I'm gonna find that, I'm gonna say, okay, Ableton, you are now the first downbeat. And I want to, for you to try to make all the other ones straight. So now when I actually play it, like as if I'm just firing it off in vinyl, this is what it would sound like. Now let's say, oh, you know what? I kind of changed my mind. What if I actually wanted this to hit on the 33rd bar, right? So the big phrase of mixing, right? So I can actually zoom in further and say, you know what? I want a little bit of that suspense. I want, a, I want the track to start like this instead. Fast forward a little bit. Right? So you can you can have that version of it. And right now, just based upon me now saying I want to actually, as much as I love this, if I want to, if I really want to use this track. I'll set that as the first, the very first marker of the track. It's gonna keep going by the time I mix it in and I'm done with this first few minutes, on the third, third bar, it's gonna hit, right? There's no confusion about it. Does that marker translate over to like the Pioneer? No, uh, what this is, is you're actually printing versions of the original track. So you're cutting off. Right, yeah, yeah, so I'm cutting it out. I could even do something where in Ableton where like, let's say the track comes in, but you only have this first, first cluster of bars and it changes instantly, right? Or some tracks, you actually, you'll get kind of the very juicy segment and it'll go into this like three minute breakdown, this pre-breakdown. But you can actually take this and you can actually copy it and you can paste versions of that rhythm if you wanted to, ex basically you're extending pieces of music. So Ableton allows you to do that. So if you wanted to really take a really dramatic drum roll in the beginning, you could. And you wanted to be more solid, you could. You could do that all in Ableton. Um, so, so far where the current marker is, this is roughly right around a seven or eight minute track, which is great, because including this, it would have been like a, probably eight, nine minutes long. That's a long track, right? But now I've identified that I can now really, if I printed this out, I can use it. I know that the peaks and the valleys, that's a healthy sound signature. If I had to do any adjustments on the mixer, it'd be very minimal, next to none. And that's good because with less lights, big speakers, a lot of chaos going on, it helps. It helps to know that at least my playlist, my cluster of music is ironed out. Yeah. How do you compare doing this manually versus using a tool like Platinum to basically automate that? Platinum notes is good. I believe it, it encourages their version of working in keys with numbers, 1A, 4B, things like that, right? You could do it that way. And by all means, do what works for you. Um, 
I always say, I always encourage you to dive deeper, find out what a 4A is. What key is that? Because it matters when you actually say, oh, I want to remix this. I want to add, it's so drummy. What if I actually threw my own Oberheim keyboard over it? What if I added a little bit of that Hammond B3 organ in it? What key is it? So therefore you want to decipher that. Yeah. And to those who don't know, and I might be mistaken actually, because I don't, I'm not a user of Platinum Notes, but my understanding of Platinum Notes, Platinum Notes is like an auto game kind of software yeah. where it normalizes your whole collection to be the same game or mastery level. That way when you load tracks on your gear, you have to do less trimming, right? I think that that's kind of, I don't like that personally, because I think that gets you assuming that you never have to mess with the trim anymore, right? And when you do adjust the trim, you're precisely getting it to the point as opposed to letting the software kind of you know figure it out for you. And so you don't forget that that's even a step you need to do, right? If you jump on someone else's gear, if you're if your workflow is platinum notes, you never adjust trims ever, or you're gonna be peaking, you're gonna be quiet, you're gonna be all these things, right? So that's one thing that I don't like about platinum notes, but my question was like it looks like you were, you know, you're adjusting the tracks, you're mm -hmm. going in, you're making those changes manually. Manually. Yeah. But then you're still, but then I guess when you perform, you still, you still check do. your trims. Always. Great point. Always use your ears. And you know what? Especially sometimes we're given the responsibility when we step into the mix and working with a group of artists and we're about to mix into it, you realize there's like damn near almost red lines happening. You can correct that by all means, correct the red line, stop the red line, right? So you can address that or you notice, hey, these speakers are great, but they're pushing three yellow. We don't need to be three yellow because there's maybe, I don't know, 12 people out there. It's like, there's no need to blast their ears off. There's not enough bodies to fill in the space. So you can adjust that and know that the track you send in is you would still have to adjust the trim and get it all just right too. That, that's, a, that's an instinctual call. So at the moment you get into the decks, you want to address that. So yeah, good, good point, good point, good point. Any other questions so far? Good. So there's a lot of different things you can do in Ableton. So Ableton primarily is a music making software. Um, I can show you a little something I kind of just been putting together here. Um, so. Edits and remixes are one thing, ironing out your collection, identifying what keys you're working with, doing time adjustments to certain things, right? And Ableton works really great with an instrument called uh, Push, or um, they have a lot of really great controllers that work. The APC40 is a really great one, one I really love. The moment you plug in that controller, you can use the entire controls as a sequencer. So you can hold phrases, you can add effects to it, you can fade certain tracks. If you're working in a session where you have like, let's just say 10, 10 tracks of individual pieces of instruments, you can, by plugging in this controller to APC40, you can actually manually fade pieces in and out as opposed to automating everything. You can give, you can make things not so linear. So it's a good mixing tool. So something like this, um, let me mute certain things here. And let's see what we got here. So, yeah, this is one I'm kind of just sketching. So it's mainly a tool for sketching ideas and for making music. So what this does is that as soon as you kind of get the general mix down of the track, you can export the drum, the bass, the pads into a waveform, audio, audio stems. Take those stems and put them back into Ableton. You refeed the machine and give the CPU a break, <laughs> basically. So it's not trying to remember to play everything all at once, but it's a good way to audition your ideas and have a folder where all the pieces are in their folders. You can give it to your friend, send it to an artist you love to remix it. That's how you send music that you work on to everyone. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You can. This is what I mean is that if you were working on a track, and let's say you had a track, um, a collection of music that you were ironing out, and you realize I can use pieces of this track and put that into these tracks I love and kind of EQ them in. So are you using this more for a uh, production kind of thing, or is it more, or how do you incorporate this in the future? So, what I would do is there was a there was a time. To keep that answer sim simple, yes, I use it for refining my collection, for rekeying my collection, um, ironing out my collection, and using that to fuel my playlists. Yes? So, like, with that being said, you had a set and you had songs that were C, F, G, right. and you were like, hey, these three songs go well together, but yeah. not these keys. Right. I want to put them all in C, right. and then I'll move to another key after that. You could. So that's like more of what you're saying about energy. Right. Mixing. Right. Like, right. I so. Like these three together, but right. I right. Repurpose it to a different key first. You could. You could rekey certain ones, but yeah. you, those rekey tracks are now added to a volley of tracks. So three keys, three different volleys, or three different waves. So you can use that and fortify them together. How they can work together. So Ableton allows you to do that. Um, Ableton I use mainly for sketching ideas. It's like synth wave music or like psychedelic electronics, electronic us music. I use that for creating music, technically. Um, I just, it just happens to be it has so much um, MPC heritage. Like you can sample stuff and just play with stuff. You can iron stuff out. It's also a great performance tool because, like I said, this unit called the APC4, you will have something like 12 channels instead of having two, three, four channels. It allows you to mix a lot of different music. A lot of guys who are using Tractor, for example, you're using so many channels, right? Without getting ahead of yourself, if you wanted to push the envelope of your original music and have pieces of music to support that and mix those in, you can do that. Ableton allows you to do that. So, just more options. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, do you do you ever find yourself like using Ableton on a golf to like sound design and make almost make loops and make you know find out sounds that you have from for yeah. sets or like you know just so you throw it in? Totally, totally. One of the fun things we like doing is before we even, when we all get together, before we even start DJing or mixing or practicing, we'll just crack open a couple of synthesizers, Ableton, and just kind of jam some ideas. Doesn't matter what BPM, we'll have someone lead the way. If someone has a bass line, they want to play a bass line. We'll just have them play the bass line, patch that into the mixer. Uh, if you sense Ableton, patch those into the mixer because we have a mixer called the Zone 464. Um, I don't know if you guys are Gundam fans, but we named this one the Barbados because it, it literally looks like a Gundam. It's insane. Um, but it has so many channels. So we use that as it has six stereo, four mono. So with the four monos, we can actually patch guitar effects pedals and each of those channels now have access to all those up uh, pedals. Um, so you can really have some fun with ideas. But yes, it does help a lot with like getting ideas out. If you want to just, just play with ideas, soundscapes, I encourage that. Do that. It's good. It's good stuff. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone has any more questions, I will be glad to answer them. Um, I'll be hanging around for a bit. Um, I know you guys are good. Want to get back into mixing more, which is great. I, you guys, have been doing some great music with the house station and the the, the more progressive station here. Um, I'll be close by. I'll be glad to answer any more questions you guys have. Um, I want to thank you, Brian and Dance Music Initiative, all you guys for being here, and I wish you incredible success in your journey. Just have fun. Just always have fun. That's where it should be, and then know what tools you're working with. Cool. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you.